Cha Cha Pinks. You are listening to Behind the Lens. And yes, you are listening to Behind the Lens. It's nice to have Jar Jar back uh, as we count down to Star Wars, uh, The Last Jedi in December. But uh, we're not going to jump the gun like Target or any of these other, or Rite Aid or any of these stores that already have their Christmas decorations out. Or the Citadel in Orange County. I just heard on the radio this morning that they just had delivered a 115-foot-high Christmas tree um, that they're putting up now before Halloween. Um, There's something wrong with that picture. But anyway, I digress. Welcome, welcome to Behind the Lens. Uh, We are almost down to the end of October. uh, 2017 is just rushing by, and we are already in the thick of award season. Award season for the Oscar race, BAFTA, all of the different Guild Awards, Critics Awards, uh, Golden Globes. So it's going to be a big couple of months with some really amazing films coming out. And we're going to talk about some of those films shortly. But for those of you just joining us, I'm Debbie Elias, film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens. You can find my movie reviews and interviews 24-7 in print and online in the U.S. and abroad. But every Monday, I'm right here at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on Adrenaline Radio. we We have a very different show today. Two very diverse talents. Uh, joining us live at the half hour mark will be writer, director, producer David Berkman, who is going to talk about his first, his debut feature film, Haze, all about the Greek system and, of course, hazing. And over the years, that has always been at the forefront in the news, thanks in large part to deaths that have resulted because of the hazing process. And it's an interesting look, it's a narrative film. Uh, it is a, it is totally scripted, and it's and what David has done story wise is take a story by Euripides, the story of Dionysus, and use that as his framework for creating a contemporary story with fraternities, sororities, and both sides of the coin: the coin of party hardy, uh, wine and revelry, revelry orgies and frenzied uh, rituals, versus those that are not of that mindset and it creates for a really interesting film so we're going to talk with uh, about Hayes with David at the half hour mark but before then film just opened on Friday Wonderstruck and let me tell you wonder I was totally awestruck when I saw Wonderstruck it is directed by Todd Haynes Carol uh, Far From Heaven it is written by Brian Selznick, based on his own award-winning, best-selling book, Wonderstruck. This is one of the most beautiful blends of words and images that I think you will ever see, be it in the book form, which is outstanding, uh, or cinematically. And the way the film is constructed, basically, the story, in a nutshell, is this... Why am I not hearing anything here? Okay. I think, whoops. Okay, there we go. We, ha- we have a loose connection here with the headset, uh, which we're going to fix shortly. But we have two young children. We have Ben in 1977. We have Rose in 1927. Rose is deaf. Ben is a seeing, hearing child till uh, a thunderstorm with lightning happens, and he is suddenly struck deaf. And both of them wish for a different life than what they have. Ben wants a father he's never known, and Rose is obsessed with this silent film star that she chronicles everything about her in a scrapbook. Um, Ben, a collector, as his own mother describes him, finds a clue to the father that he has longed to find, and once once he is stricken by lightning and he has become deaf, He takes off. He's determined he's going to find his father. In the meantime, Rose, in 1927, reads a headline in a newspaper and sets out to the big city to find this, the actress, 
whom she admires and idolizes so much. The stories are two separate stories. Rose's story takes place in 1927. Ben's takes place in 1977. The cinematography is done by the one and only Ed Lockman. What makes this film so unique is the approach by Ed and director Todd Haynes. The 1927 version is done in black and white and is done as a silent film. Adorably, cinephiles will love this. It is a real, it is a lovely touch. There is actually a silent film within the silent film portion of Wonderstruck. However, it is the lensing, it is the lighting of both eras as we follow the journeys of Ben and Rose that are so visually stunning, including trips to the Museum of Natural History in New York, a museum that does not allow for camera crews to come in there and definitely not lighting to come in there because of the sensitivity of so many of the exhibits and the items that are can, are housed in the museum. But as you're going to hear, uh, I had an exclusive interview with cinematographer Ed Lockman, and for my money, if it were back in the 30s, in the 40s, and in the 50s when they were still when they were started doing a Best Cinematography Award for Oscar for Black and White and one for Color. Ed would be getting both of them this year. His work is exemplary. And I got to, he's always one of my favorite people. And we spoke on Thursday at great length, not only about Wonderstruck, but about other issues regarding imagery, cinematography, the state of the industry, and also the all-encompassing digital versus film world. I have excised those out for another time. What you're going to hear is our interview as we talk about Wonderstruck and Ed's technical approach, aesthetic approach, and emotional approach to the cinematography. Enjoy. You know, the, the, the logic behind it, and this is what the important thing, it wasn't that we're just holding on the film as some aesthetic reason. You know, we wanted to mirror the cinematic language that the times were representing. And in Brian Selznick's book, it's an illustrated book, but part of the book is in black and white because he wanted to mirror the world of Rose in the silent era because of she, her world is, is encompassed in deafness. Mm -hmm. So his concept or idea was to show it in drawing the way the viewer could experience the world. I, I, I mean, I, I wrote this, so I'm, I'm not plagiarizing, but I'll just read what he said. He said, I wanted to tell a story of a deaf character through silence of black and white drawings as a parallel for her point of view. This approach would also be used for the silent period of the 20 cinema as a metaphor for her world. Uh, and Selznick uh, reiterated that reading Wonderstruck and getting her story only through pictures would make the readers feel like they were Rose herself. Mm -hmm. And now Ben, who's in the 70s, the conceit of, of uh, Todd was to, you know, here's a boy that comes from a rural area in Minnesota. They're both, both characters, Rose, and then in 50 years of Parter are fleeing their homes and going to the city, which is more than daunting, you know, that, you know, like being 12 years old and entering a, a, this kind of world. So for Ben in the 70s, it would be about a hearing boy that lost his hearing. And, and so we wanted to reference like the cinematic references of urban grit and of, of city films like Mean Streets, The French Connection, and 69 was um, Midnight Cowboy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a way, it was a, a way to encompass the, the language, and that's why we want to use the cinematic techniques. So for the black and white, I looked to Kodak and found out that they still had double X negative <laughs> in their catalog, you know, 35 millimeter, 
but I, I but I, I, re I requested or reached out to them, would they manufacture that for me again? So they were very open to like do a run for me of black and white negative because today, you know, people will shoot, well now they don't shoot on color film, and, but you could shoot on color film and, and make it a monochromatic image in the DI Right. Or shoot digitally and make the black and white. But I discovered or found with Todd when we did I'm Not There and that we shot in 35 black and white, the exposure latitude and the grain structure is totally different than color film or the digital media. And that's why we want it has a much more limited range. It only has a range of about two or three stops. And the grain structure is different. So I wanted to reference the way a silent film could have felt like. Well, and what you now, also... The conceit, the conceit for Todd was, he, we didn't shoot, we only, we shot a film within a film, the, the reference The Wind by uh, Victor Sostrom, where we shot in the format of 133, the actual aperture, to the way silent film. But Todd wanted to connect the two stories between the 20s and the 70s, and so we use 240. So, you know, if you were uh, strict, you know, about that, the, the idea was he wanted to tell one story between the two children, bet split between the two time periods. Sure. Well, you know, and I love what you did shooting with, with the Kodak, with the double X negative, because we really get a truer black and white of the 20s as opposed to all of these transpositions that a lot of these filmmakers think I can shoot on digital and just make it look black and white and it's not right. the same thing the purity is yeah, not that, there that, that's my that's my my point and then I wanted to use the cinematic tools that people had at that time as much as possible so I shot with my older Cook Speed Pancro lenses <laughs> that I have a set of and they, they were shooting with those lenses back then. I mean, they were shooting with other sets, you know, super boltars, but, but the, the, there was, in my research, they were also shooting with Cook Speed Tank Roads, many of the silent films. So that was another um, thing that I think added to the, the look of the film. And then other things that I did in the day exteriors I, I use tungsten 10Ks. I use bigger tungsten lights than go with HMI. Mm -hmm. So I try to use the same kind of, you know, lighting techniques. Uh, there's this one sequence we use an arc, you know, because they use arcs at the time. Mm -hmm. And then in, this, in the 70s, it was more, um, well, I... It, I want to say we're creating visual metaphors for deafness, both for Rose in 27 and Ben in 77. Mm -hmm. I like to think of, I like to think of Rose hearing with images. Yes. And, um, and, and the, and the conceit for, uh, the, the other thing was that, you know, on it, when I do, when I start a project with Todd, you know, we, we like to reference not only, the time period, but also what illustrates the, the politics, the history, the demographics, the, you know, the fashion and the cinematic language of that time period mm -hmm. that helps us find what the emotion, the emotional context is for the details. And, uh, you know, it's the golden 20s before the Depression in 29, because our story takes place in 27 was about growth and prosperity but I don't know if you're old enough but I remember the 70s the, in New York the US economy was in a recession and stagnation yeah. New York City that was was an economic decline and physical deterioration and, and looking to the French connection you know like and uh, Owen Rosman and Billy Freakin they were using zooms for punctuation they were using long tracking shots in the street without track 
there was a very there was an immediacy to the images. They were kind of documenting the world to create a certain reality base to the stories. And so I found out through Owen that they were using a Western dolly. That's like a piece of plywood with four pneumatic wheels on it. So we, we used those, you know, which was kind of laborious. And we also used a wheelchair. We made a wheelchair with a, it's called a rickshaw dolly with a handheld camera, with the operator with a handheld camera. Again, to capture the immediacy and uh, the spontaneity of, of the, you know, like when the boy comes out of the port of Bard. And, you know. mm-hmm. and then another aspect of what I did to, to reference the 70s was film stocks were different there in their color balance. And also what they printed the, the films on. I, in my research, they were starting to uh, print on Fuji, you mm-hmm. know, for costs. And I found that the shadow areas tended to go magenta, yeah. and the highlights tended to go yellow green. So I, I also tried to implement that in the look of the 70s. Mm-hmm. Did, did, did you respond to that, like the color palette? of the 70s looks different than what films look like today. Absolutely. I mean, I can go back and just look at photographs I have, and it's funny you mentioned Fuji. Um, Films that I shot in college in the 70s were actually printed, uh, developed on Fuji. And that that was always something that it did always have that slightly magenta greeny tint and over exactly. time, it has become more pronounced. Right. And and even though they were shooting on 5254, which was ASA 100, pushing it to stop, when you start printing it on Fuji, then it shifted the color in the mm-hmm. negative. Yep. So, so what I want to say was the gritty 70s look of realism and raw camera movement was contrasted to the black and white kind of chiscuro... chiscuro lighting and formalism and balanced formalism and orchestrated camera movement of the silent motion pictures. You know, I'm curious because you've got, you, you've got quite a few zooms happening in the 1977 portion. Right. What, were, what zooms were you, what lenses were you using for zoom? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I still have my lenses, you know, about 20 to 100 cook. Mm-hmm. and an Ingenue 25 to 250. And in my research talking to Ingenue, I, they mentioned to me that, I said, why, why did films also have a different look? Was the glass much different than the you know modern glass in lenses? And they said that there was more lead in the glass in the 70s that they, you know, for ecological reasons, they've had to take out. And I still have lenses from that time period or in the 80s, Mm -hmm. you know. So I I was using my older zooms. Mm -hmm. I I have a a 20 to 60 and a 20 to 100 cook and an Ingenue 25 to 250. Mm. So we were were using those lenses, the longer end, you know, kind uh, kind of isolating the character. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what Todd felt or wanted, what he was, he felt another aspect of the um, 70s look was kind of this uh, floating suspension of the, um, uh, he said, we, we wanted to create kind of a visual language to emulate the point of view of, a, of, of Ben, the newly deaf child. Mm-hmm. So we, 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 we use visual language of floating shots over crank on various suspension devices to help remove us from the objective experience of the hearing world. So, you know, that, that's where I was saying we're using a rickshaw dolly, mm-hmm. we're using a Western dolly. You know, we were, we were much freer with the camera than kind of the orchestrated formalism of the black and white Mm -hmm. Well, something that you do exceedingly well with this film, Ed, is 
you retain the POV of each of the children. We see, uh-huh. we experience the wonder through your angling, through your framing, that each of these, okay. ch- that each child is experiencing in their respective time periods. And I just, yeah, I, well, I, that I thought was magical. Yeah, like- yeah, I mean, look, the film is about finding your place in the world. And, you know, it's an exploration of your identity and your imagination. And, and he's honoring the children's world, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, that's why he felt the book was intensely cinematic, because so much of the book is about the point of view of the children. Mm-hmm. You know, what I, I've got to ask you about shooting in the museum, because I can only imagine because you were in the actual museum, this had to be a pain in the butt in many respects because something tells me they weren't shutting the museum down in the daytime for you. No, no, well, uh, yeah, the the point is they were were a big fan of of, uh, the book, of uh, Brian's book, and they never let film crews in the Natural History Museum. And they made a, a real exception to let us shoot there under many restrictions. <laughs> and those restrictions were that we had to go in every night after closing, which was around 7 o'clock, and come out in the morning. So I was very limited on the amount of equipment I could bring in and out mm-hmm. because of the time restraint of, of shooting time. So I did tests. I pushed of the negative 52.19 of stop uh, uh, to a stop and a half, two stop. And I could have shot in the museum because the other point is the dioramas had to be the the, the focal point of the viewer. Right. Because those are things as a, you know, someone walking in the museum, you, you feel those are the most lit area. Well, the, 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 the diorama that we wanted to but primarily what the story is around is the wolf diorama. Mm-hmm. That was incredibly dark, you know. In fact, we found out three of the kino flow, or kino fluorescents were out. Oh. So that was a, a two-month negotiation to allow their people, because those are all hermetically sealed, to allow us to put six kino flow tubes in there with our gel to match their gel which was midnight blue, I think, um, to be able to shoot there. So in the end, we decided the sequences all in the museum are shot digitally on an Alexa Mini. Mm -hmm. And I used live grain, which was a, a big help because it tracks the highlights in the shadow areas. You know about live grain? No, that's not even heard of that. It's a fairly new process that an engineer has, uh, he actually licensed it to, um, you know, uh, digital houses to, uh, you know, color correct houses, whatever you call them, um, uh, where you do your timing, which tracks the highlights as fine grain and the, and the underexposed areas, the lower exposed areas, with larger grain. So it mimics what film does. So there's a logarithm that can figure out where your exposure is in the negative, and it actually manufactures the grain to that size. And it also can mimic what film stocks you use. So I had experimented with that on Wiener Dog, Mm -hmm. and I told, you know, we were at Harbor, you know, uh, with Joe Goller, who was the colorist, and they they knew about it, and they we we uh, implemented that in in our grading for the Natural History Museum because we shot digitally. For me, the color separation isn't the same as film. You know, this is just it, this is just a way of using grain. It isn't just an overlay on the image the way it is used previously. 
You know what I mean? They just use a grain structure mm -hmm. over the total image, but it doesn't really track the highlights and the shadows. Okay. So that's really the difference with this, uh, you know, device called Live Brain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so to talk more about the museum, so I could then go in with, you know, less light. I, I actually shot at twelve eighty. I didn't shoot at eight hundred. I, I, I uh, pushed a little, which I know is weird because in film, or in film, when you push, you get more shadow detail, where it's just the opposite in the digital world. You get more on the highlight side and you lose the shadow detail. Mm -hmm. But I needed the speed. And it also allowed us to shoot in other areas of the museum that we wouldn't have been able to shoot in unless I lit it. So I, I was I was very happy with the results of the of the digital. I mean, you didn't know that was shot digitally. You know, no. the low light world digital loves. You know, I, I I I'm not so crazy about it in you know medium range exposure. You know, or not, I'm not crazy about the color rendition of the digital world because my eye is trained to what what I see in film. It's always too clean for me. You know, that's why yeah. people are using 50-year-old lenses. Every, everybody's trying to, like, go the opposite of what the manufacturers and engineers and the marketing is doing. Everybody's going 8K, 6K, 4K, mm -hmm. you know, sharper and sharper. I mean, it's like, you know, not every painting should be painted the same way. You know, like, you know, not every... Every story should be told in a photorealistic way. You know, there was German Expressionism, there was Impressionism, there was uh, Turner, and uh, it was a modernist. You know, why limit our palette? Why are we bending everything to the technology? You yeah. Know? No, I understand exactly what you're saying, Ed. And I have to say, all anybody has to do is look at anything that you do on film, especially anything you and Todd do together. And there is such life in the images that you create. There's life, there's texture. It's three-dimensional just like the world is. Yeah, you know, I've got to ask you, would you consider this film to be one of the most perhaps challenging and gratifying of the films that you have done, especially with Todd? I don't know. You know, and you always want your last film. I, you know, each film is a challenge. This was obviously the largest budget Todd and I ever worked with, but it was so ambitious. It felt like a low-budget film with the time mm -hmm. element. Plus, we had children. Yes. So, you know, we had to shoot sometimes with uh, in black and white and color the same day. Um I don't know, you know, you just do what you do. I mean, look, the film in some ways I felt closest to was I'm Not There, because mm -hmm. that was that was me growing up in that time period. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, my, and the film references, you know, the neorealism, the, uh, the Godard, the New Wave, uh, the, the more modernist, the Antonioni and Fellini. The, you know, the cinematic references we used were, were like when I was in film school. So that film, I probably feels more like a diary for me. Mm -hmm. But then if I look at Far From Heaven, that was you know, all the ideas I had from art school. I couldn't I could implement in that film, you know, in color and using color as a psychological tool rather than just a... Uh, decorative means. Mm -hmm. So each film is, is so wonderful to work with Todd because he he experiments and he explores in, ex in each film in a different language and a different mythology about how to tell a story. And that, that, that's what excites me. So I, I can't pick one out and say <laughs> I like it better than another. You know, I like Carol. I, 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 I was pleasantly surprised that there was such an immediacy to those images and the way we 
portray that world. And is anybody that liked Carol or loved Carol, you will love Beyond Love, Wonderstruck. Again, is directed by Todd Haynes. It is written by Brian Selznick, be- adapted from his book of the same name. Breakout actors in here. Little Millicent Simmons, who plays Rose. This is her first film. And Millicent is a hearing-impaired young lady. Ben is played by the adorable Oaks Fegley, who we met in Pete's Dragon. And we also have a relative newcomer here uh, with Jaden Michael, who plays a friend that Ben meets along the way in his travels, a young boy named Jamie. Julianne Moore stars as the adult Rose and also as our silent film star in the 1927, 1927 her performance is outstanding. Do not be surprised to hear her name called out. Oscar nomination morning for a Best Actress Oscar, Best Actress Oscar. It is, as I said, I was awestruck by Wonderstruck, and I continue to be so. Uh, and there will be more of Ed's interview sometime later this week uh, on BehindTheLensOnline.net. So stay tuned for more. More discussion on digital versus film and even some discussion on the definition of what images are in today's world with CGI, cameras, film, digital, and everything else. But right now, I am so pleased to welcome David Berkman. Hello, David. Hi, Debbie. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. You know, you you, you got to follow the pre-recorded Ed Lockman. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. That that that's that's a tough one. But I have to say, wow, I did not know what to expect with Hayes. Talk about a shock factor. There is a real yeah, shock well, factor. Yeah, well, obviously we wanted to um, you know, make sure that we were really being truthful and honest as, and as authentic as possible about the realities of what goes on behind uh, frat and sorority house walls. And this film pulls no punches, that's true. Um, it's based uh, largely on my own experience, um, and I can speak to that. But we also spent a couple of years um, during the casting process doing exhaustive research, talking to people of all ages, uh, ranging anywhere from people who were in college going through the experience to people all the way up to their 80s, and talked to them, and they were very open about um, some of the things that they endured, some of the things in some cases they inflicted on others uh, in in the context of fraternity and sorority hazing. And what we found, which was remarkable, was that a lot of the stories that we, we heard were the same stories over and over again um, from, again, all different age groups, and um, it, it spoke to me and resonated with me because a lot of the detailed things they described were things that I experienced as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Hollywood has always been fascinated with Greek life, right? It's almost a genre unto itself, but ever since Animal House, the subject matter has mostly been treated as a comedy, and I knew that was there was a space to uh, tell a film about this darker aspect of that experience and to be very honest about it. And in being honest, of course, um, we were showing things that are truly very brutal, uh, and and very shocking, you know. And that that's something that because uh, right from the get go, you have the first images. You have this great music, and you think, okay, this is kind of cool. You've got all these images that are going back into the early not earlier 1900s when the Greek system really started coming into play, and all these respectable, fine-looking young men in their suits and ties, and some of them with their boater hats. And then all of a sudden, you just in, in a heartbeat, change the entire tenor to 21st century madness, mayhem, and debauchery. And yes. you just, you grab our attention immediately. But you don't just have madness and mayhem going on. You very quickly and keenly, without exposition, we, very, we meet our, our, basically our protagonist, Nick, who's played by Kirk, uh, Kirk Curran. And so right away we have somebody to hold on to, to grasp. And then you slowly introduce a couple other characters, notably Nick's brother Pete, played by Mike Bledger. And 
talk about your story construct here. I love the fact you went back to the Greeks. You went back to Euripides <laughs> to get your construct yeah. for this film. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that was the thing. I mean, I knew I wanted to, like I say, uh, tell a story about Greek life that was a little more, um, not a little more, much more authentic um, and realistic. But I didn't really have that device, that, that narrative thread, until I, um, until I lighted upon ancient Greek mythology and read Euripides the Bacchae, and I was like, oh my goodness, you've got the Greek god of Dionysus, who's the god of wine and revelry and ecstasy. It was like the perfect uh, framing device for this story. And there's some other, um, other myths that are infused less overtly throughout the film, notably uh, Echo and Narcissus, which is... Mm-hmm. Uh, encapsulated by the Mimi and the Nick subplot. Um, And so sort of hanging our hat on that, um, I thought that hopefully there would also be a sort of more universal resonance, because while the movie is obviously targeted specifically and sets very specifically in this universe of Greek life, um, my hope was that some of the themes and some of the experiences of human suffering, um, manufactured human suffering, would be something that would resonate and transcend that world. And so the Greek mythology felt like a perfect way to sort of um, enter that. Well, and that's something that I picked up on throughout the film is you get all these these subgenres and these very topical thematic issues popping up that all really boil that have you know there's been a lot of discussion on water waterboarding so much of what hazing right. is uh, is very analogous to waterboarding and we see this whole idea of puni- the system of punishment and reward that that conditioning and yes. the domestic violence issues it's you know these relationships the boy girl relationships um th- that carries over that hyped up you know super frenzied uh energetic frat life and hazing period it carries over into everything and then of course the bottom yeah. line is it actually is the cruelty of man right right and uh we certainly wanted to to get there and i'm glad that that it seems that that's coming through and i think that the other thing that i always found fascinating both from my own personal experience of having been hazed and endured that all of that um is the the willingness of human beings to mm-hmm. to suffer in this way um and you know i'm not a psychologist but i have my own theories that there is something in in human nature that not only there's not only a destructive force, a desire to destroy and to harm, but there's also a, a strange fascination with in, enduring a certain measure of suffering. And I mm-hmm. think it's no accident that in Greek life we're talking about people who are often quite privileged, who have lived lives where there have been relatively you know, little suffering has been experienced, and they enter into this, this place where they then sort of thrill to the idea of having to suffer and that was my experience i mean i felt a, an adrenaline rush you know you feel very alive when you're going through these things and i liken it to sort of the fascination we as a culture have with horror films or mm-hmm. um amusement park rides right mm-hmm. i mean these are experiences where we come face to face with what feels like our own death but we also at the same time have this concomitant feeling of safety. We're not really going to die while we're mm-hmm. sitting in a dark theater watching a horror film, uh, but we get the rush and the thrill of feeling that experience. And I think being hazed has that same thing going on, mm-hmm. and there is this, um, there's this need in us as, as the animal side <laughs> to ex- have that fight-or-flight mechanism triggered every once mm-hmm. in a while. Well, something that I found, and this is a testament to your actors, is I was also getting, particularly with the character of Nick, with the character of Pete, this this need, this desperation for a human connection that because of this privileged life or this very upper middle class bringing that so many of these, you know, so many pledges and the Greek system have, you know, they it's like they're lacking a human connection. You know, it's when you have money... How often do you really do the family things like go on camping trips and picnics? And yeah, I know right. growing up, people I knew that were better off than, than we were, well, no, they would never have thought of packing a picnic basket, basket and going to Valley Forge for, you know, Interesting. fried chicken lunch. But I'm seeing, yeah. you know, 
in the portrayals, I'm also picking up a desperation and a sadness and a neediness, the need to belong. And I, that I found particularly interesting uh, in the performance and through the construct of the film. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, I think that, you know, the other thing that I just have to remind myself is that when you're 18 years old and you're leaving home to go off to college for the very first time, it's a very scary transitional moment mm -hmm. in a person's life, right? I mean, um, you know, we we leave home, we come to these these brand new places, we have to create all new friendships and um, and the fraternities and the sororities have all of the accoutrements and sing symbols of home. They have yeah. these palatial mansions. They invite you in. They're very welcoming. The rush period is all about, you know, warmth. And, and here you're going to shrink your world down to this smaller group, this smaller social group where there's going to be structured social activities. You're going to meet, you know, people, men and women, who are going to become your family. And that, that's the language of, of this experience. And so I can see why it's very attractive for a lot of people. And, you know, why it was attractive to me when I left home for the first time to go off to, to mm -hmm. college. Yeah, and, th and there again, it's that idea you need that connection. You've just severed and lost the connection, whatever you had at home. So you've got to yes. replace that. And I see that, you know, Kirk did such a beautiful job with facial expressiveness to yeah. convey much of that, I was really taken by what he brought to the role. And on the flip side of that, what Mike brought to Pete, because the two of them are on opposite sides of the fence. They're actually brothers, but as in not Greek brothers, but brother brothers. And they're, yeah. on, they're, on, uh, they're on polar opposites on the issue of the Greek system. Yes. Yeah, and I think that, you know, obviously that was... Um you know, intended to be a conduit to sort of explore these these other themes of well, what is the nature of brotherhood? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Greek system talks so much about that. This is about brotherhood. Um, and so I thought it was very interesting to explore, okay, well, you have biological brothers, you've, you've grown up together, um, and then that's one kind of brotherhood, and then you have the Greek system and the brotherhood that they're espousing. And I think that um, even even deeper than that is this question of what is the nature of friendship? Mm -hmm. um, what is the nature of family? I mean, why do, we, why do we connect with certain people and not others? Does it have something to do with um, shared adversity? Mm -hmm. Do we have to suffer together in order to come together? Um, I mean, these are complex questions I don't know that I have all the answers to, but I certainly wanted the film to present those um, in, a, in a hopefully compelling, dramatic way. And, mm -hmm. um, and these themes of brotherhood were, were at the center of all of that. And, of course, you don't discriminate. You spend time on the sororities as well. And, you know, you, you get into the issues there about, you know, broken hearts and stealing boyfriends and lusting after this one. And, you no, know, the sisterhood, it's like you can't cross another sister and you can't take her guy and you can't. And it's and, you know, food. No, you're not supposed to eat. I mean, it just, you tackle so many things. Personally, if I were a parent, I'm an aunt. I have two nephews, one that graduated college, one that is currently in college. If I saw this film and I knew that they had any idea of wanting to get into the Greek system, I'd be flying back to Philadelphia and telling my, and, you know, <laughs> holding my brother hostage, you cannot let your sons do this. Right. Um, yeah. That's how powerful... The, your film is with what you know everything that is unfolding underneath the debauchery and the and the bad behavior that we're seeing yeah i mean my you know my my mother said the same thing she said if i only knew what you went through i would have come down there to school and pulled you right out mm -hmm. um so that's i think a common feeling for people who see this film and and understand what truly can go on um going back to what you're saying about the the sorority and and the women i think that um you know, not a lot of films deal really honestly and op mm -mm. openly with, with that side of things. It usually tends to focus on the fraternity. And while this film does that, too, I, I definitely wanted to have um, an opportunity to, to express and light upon that whole part of the experience because it's, a, it's, a, it's also a central part of the experience for the men because the way in which fraternities and sororities relate to each other mm -hmm. is very fascinating to me. And I think that 
you know, what we see in part in Hayes is how the women can be, um, for lack of a better word, sort of complicit in their own misogyny. Mm -hmm. Um, That there is a, uh, the patriarchy is so powerful and so deep that in aspiring to be more powerful, the women have to play the men's game. And uh, they cut each other down um, and objectify each other just as much as the men are doing the objectif- objectifying. Mm-hmm. And I find that very interesting. And I think that, you know, again, this is so much about um, power uh, and who, who has the power and, and control and, and how do you feel safe. Um, and so I knew that there's, you can't have a, a movie about fraternity life and not include something about the sorority side of things. Mm -hmm. Well, and something else that you included that I thought was very important, and I'm so glad you did it, you included in there as poor Nick is lamenting that he's he's flunking out. He doesn't even know if he's going to make it through the semester. He failed his his chemistry midterm. You talk about grade suffering. Yes. And... Yeah, I mean... It's impossible to um, to sort of concentrate on the central purpose of being in college, right? <laughs> There's the sequence where everybody says, I'm here to get an education. And that is really what the function of college is, right? But it's also clearly um, set up and designed as a place where we also develop and learn social uh, behaviors mm-hmm. and, and how to connect and relate to people. And that's as important, if not more important, for many young people to learn how to, um, how to, as you say, connect with people. Mm-hmm. And these are, you know, uh, training grounds for future leaders. And, um, and unfortunately, I think the lessons that are being taught in a lot of cases are pretty bleak. Yeah, well, it explains a lot of what we see unfolding on, on the national stage, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> you, you know, I've got to talk to you about the technical aspects of making haze. And most notably, you know, you, you along with Jeff McCutcheon and Akiva Potter, you, Potok, you did all of your own cinematography. But then you've got your yes. editors, Ryan Carpenter, Tony Leach, and Matthew McLean. Hats off to them because the footage you have, this must have been a laborious editing process to put this all together with some semblance of story. Because as you're showing a lot of the uh, brutality of much of the hazing rituals, you've got different camera angles coming in, and I can and you're not being sensitive in some areas. You're just going full bore. Um, so how challenging was the lensing and the subsequent editing of this? Yeah, well, thank you for recognizing that. Yeah, and it was very laborious. I mean, in some ways, this was a leviathan, just an absolute beast. Um, you know, I am uh, as many of my cast and crew will probably jokingly attest. I am not one for you know, one take and we're done. I shoot a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and in a film like this, where we sort of set the stage um, for an opportunity, there, it's very scripted. Um, at, you know, the lines are being delivered from the screenplay, but we also allowed for a lot of extemporaneous moments for the party scenes, for the hazing scenes to sort of breathe, and we wanted there to sort of sort of set an environment where, in a way, we were sort of throwing real parties, and we were uh, building worlds uh, where people could then sort of let loose and forget almost, in a sense, that they were making a film, mm-hmm. and that's how we sort of arrived at this hopefully certain measure of authenticity where you really feel like, you know, we've had people say to us, did you go and shoot in a, at a real fraternity party? Uh, I thought, I, I no, was wondering, I mean, it is that authentic. That's actually, I thought you might have. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that, that you think that because, um, Despite that, this was entirely staged. Everyone is an actor. Um, we did shoot in an actual fraternity house, but it wasn't during an actual fraternity party. Mm-hmm. We staged the parties entirely from the ground up. Um, I mean, it was good that we shot in a real fraternity house because I think it lend, lent the act, gave the actors um, sure. a sort of sense of realism and, and brought something more to their performances. But we shot, I think we counted at one point, something like 300 hours of footage. Oh, my God. Uh, for a one-hour and 45-minute movie. So the editors, as you point out, were confronted with just an absolutely impossible task. Oh. And, um, and we spent 
way longer than many films, I would imagine, um, pouring over that footage and really trying to figure out how we were going to construct and reconstruct things to tell the best version of this we possibly could. And you're right, hats off to them, because um, each of them brought their own uh, flavor and their own um, personalities to the edit. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it sort of seamlessly works together, even though you have sort of these different components, all in service of both the real and the hyper real. And, um, and it was, it was quite a challenge, but, uh, a thrilling one and very exciting one. And, um, and we're very happy with the way it all came together. You know, I'm curious because you've got over 300 hours of footage. Did you wait until the end of shooting and collecting all this footage to start your editing process? Or were you getting at least some passes or partial passes as you went along? I really wish we had gotten partial passes as we went along. And if I were ever, you know, the next time I do this, um, we will have an on-site, an on-set editor. I think that's the the best way to make a movie. Um, But in this case, um, everything about the making of this film was unique. I mean, this was an independent film in the purest sense of the word. Everyone was working on this as a labor of love. Um, But it was a unique film just by, based on the sheer numbers. And this is my first feature, and we always joke, uh, my producing partner, Jamie Ehrenberg, who also happens to be my wife, we always joke when we watch the movie, um, you know, how the heck did we pull this off? Because, you, you know, you set out to make your first feature, you think, oh my gosh, well, a smart person would write a, a, a movie that takes place in one location, mm-hmm. you know, with four or five actors. Um, but no, I had to write a fraternity movie with lots of party scenes and huge hazing scenes, and we ended up with, I think, something like 500 extras in this film in total, and it was just an absolute um, massive, massive movie. But because we had so, such limited resources, we didn't mm-hmm. have the foresight to um, to build the film as we went along. We kind of had to do things linearly, and so we ended up shooting this movie. I think we counted something like a total of and this is going to sound insane, but we shot a total of 90 shoot days over the course of 18 months. That is beyond insane. And um, it was spread out over these periods of time, and we sort of had to find chunks of time when when everybody involved was available because um, we weren't able to lock everybody down with big paychecks. People were just sort of working on this thing when they could. And uh, so we worked during the summer and then took a break, and then we had to work over winter break and um, so it's amazing to me that we didn't have it, it, an incredible amount of continuity problems, but somehow we managed to pull it off. And um, and the actors and the crew, I have to say, I mean, I love each and every one of them dearly. We are all, we came together so, uh, there's just such a close bond that we have together because because of the spirit in which we were making this thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think we got very lucky. You know, we, we also joked that on day one, you know, we shot in this dirty, gross, disgusting, sweaty fraternity house. And, um, you know, Jamie and I, and I were going to go in the next day after this first, you know, 12-hour 12 day, twelve hour shoot. We thought we'd come back on day two to, uh, to Tumbleweeds. You know, we thought nobody's going to come back. But somehow everybody came back. And I think there was this sort of, like, spirit of... Uh, it was like we almost formed our own fraternity and sorority oh of God. sorts. Um, yeah. and, uh, and everybody was very committed, and we, we were very, very lucky. We, we call it the movie gods. Um, because everything just kind of worked out. Well, before you can even start with the movie gods, you got to look to the finance gods. How do you get a <laughs> film like this financed? This is not exactly the kind of film where even on Indiegogo or Kickstarter where everybody's going to jump right out and say, hey, this is a good one to throw some money at. Um, this, this was a real crapshoot going in to see if you could even come up with the financing, was it not? Completely. And um, we didn't even go that route. We didn't do the crowdsourcing because, as you point out, this movie can be polarizing. It yeah. is, is, you know, the beginning of this conversation is a shocking movie. It's a hard watch. It's not for everyone. Um, and and also, um, I think that we, you know, we tr- there's such a long, long story about the, the origin of this film that we probably don't have time for today. But um, after essentially trying to put this thing together in a more traditional sense uh, mm-hmm. in Hollywood, um, there was a point in time where a switch just kind of went off, and we decided we really wanted to just do this ourselves. And the financing that we raised was uh, essentially a friends and family situation. Um, mm-hmm. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we, we knew from having 
sort of toiled through that Hollywood experience. We got very cynical about it, and we decided, no, we are going to do this in a way where we have 100% creative control over everything and all decisions about the way in which the film is produced. And so we didn't want to tie ourselves down to any financing that would um, disrupt that in any way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, that presents you with a whole different (laughs) set of obstacles and challenges when you don't have a lot of money. Uh, everything takes longer, which is, you know, again, 90 shoot days, 18 months shoot, um, you know, a very lengthy editing process. Uh, everything just took longer than it, than it would if you had money. But I wouldn't trade it for the world. For me, um, the way we made this film maybe can't be replicated. And I've learned, you know, I've, we've also said we'll never do another movie like this again because mm-hmm. it's so challenging. Um, but, uh, but that said, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm really, really proud that we were able to do what we did, and, um, and it's, it's kind of a unique thing to say. You know, we basically made, I mean, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I feel like we made a movie um, that has more people and more moving parts in it for the least amount of money, maybe ever. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, that could be a pretty, a pretty close description, David. I mean, it just... I am just utterly amazed that you pulled this off with the logistics that you were dealing with. Uh, and not only did you pull it off, you got a distribution deal. Yes, yes, we did. Um, we were very fortunate to meet the folks at uh, Gravitas Ventures, and, um, and they have uh, been very good to us, and we've released the film uh, on all VOD and cable-on-demand platforms. It's on iTunes now, obviously. Uh, Amazon, etc., um, and uh, and we're, we're we're thrilled that the movie's out there and and is actually doing fairly well. Um, uh, there was a time where I think the trailer was the number one most popular trailer on iTunes, and just for a movie of this size, um, with no recognizable, you know, with with only up and coming actors, mm-hmm. um, no recognizable movie stars in it, um, to be able to be out there on that stage side by side with some of the uh, some of the larger studio productions is just a thrill. Oh, I mean, it, it has to be. You know, before I let you go, because we have a couple minutes yet, I want to ask you about the music in the film. You've got, you've got your definite, your source music, your needle drops, and then you've got your score. And I'm curious how you found, how you put that together, because you know, films with have, that have a budget have enough trouble with licensing fees for music. You have no money. How do you get right. 32 needle drops in a film? Yeah, the, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, again, um, resourcefulness and time um, and just uh, patience and commitment to quality. Um, you know, I sort of think of it as a, as a triangle. You have quality, time, and money, and you can pick two of those things. We didn't have money. So Knew he wanted quality, so you got to spend the time. And Matthew McLean, who plays Kilman in Hayes, but he also was one of the editors on Hayes and became a full-fledged co-producer on the film, he and I worked together as music supervisors for almost a year curating uh, 32 um, needle drop songs that you hear in the film. Wow. And they were mostly um, independent artists. Uh, a lot of a lot of them were from the Washington, D.C. area, which is where we shot the film. Mm -hmm. Um, We tried to sort of stay local. And we just spent an incredible amount of time, you know, listening to things online, going to shows, meeting with local artists, talking to them, showing them cuts of the film, getting them excited about the project, talking about um, collaborating with them and sort of rising together. And they joined us in the same spirit that the cast and crew joined us with just a faith and a belief in what we were doing in the in the message of the film, in the um, story we were trying to tell, and 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 the quality of things, and they um, most of them lent their music to the production, um, and uh, and we you know we were very uh, particular about we didn't want to just pick anything, so we were very particular about choosing artists and, and songs that we felt were really outstanding, and we're incredibly proud of the soundtrack that we yeah. put together. On the, on the other side of things, talking for a moment about the score, um, Daniel Rogers, who is, in, in my opinion, an incredibly talented uh, musician and composer, 
Um, I've worked with him several times. He he and I uh, worked together very early on in developing the story uh, for the film, and, and we were talking about the music, and uh, we were very curious to know, well, what does ancient Greek music sound like? Because we knew the story was based on ancient Greek myths, so we thought, hmm, that might be kind of interesting to to infuse the score with some ancient Greek. And he did some homework, and he found um, some professors at, I believe it was the University of Portland, who... Mm-hmm. They, their specialty is ancient Greek music, and not only are they scholars when it comes to this kind of music, they also are musicians in their own right, and they fashioned from scratch what they knew to be the instruments that the ancient Greeks would have used and collected 24 known melodies from ancient Greek, and they cut a CD, which is an incredibly well-produced, well-performed um, CD of the, of these melodies and they're haunting and they're unique and they're fascinating melodies and they collaborated with us as well and lent their CD to us and um, and then the other side of things Dan and I talked about the idea that his compositions would be these the opposite end of the spectrum they would be these ultra modern um, very um, sort of almost futuristic like electronic score and. So we have on the one end the ancient, and on the other end the ultra modern, mm-hmm. in service of again this idea that the themes and the experiences of the human being in these situations aren't just specific to Greek life; they are something universal about them. And we wanted the music um, to reflect that. And so what Dan also did was he combined and threaded together um, the ancient and the modern as well. And we there are moments in the film where they overlap and they connect and they weave together in these really um, tremendous ways. And so uh, the music, I'm glad you asked about the music because it's one of the things I'm really the most <laughs> excited about in the movie. Um, well, David, and, I, uh, that's the story. I can't thank you enough. We are all out of time today. I hope you'll come back on the show. I would love to have you come back on and talk more about a first feature film, The Experience. Um, this has I been, would love to. This has been an absolute joy and uh everybody that they, they should see Hayes. It it's an eye opener. And uh it is as you said, it's on all the digital platforms. So go yeah, out. Yeah, if you and go to Hayesmovie dot com, um you can find out all about where you can see it. Yep. David, thank you so much and I will talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, Debbie. It was a pleasure being on. Oh, bye bye. Bye bye. And that is all the time we have today as I'm getting the evil eye from Pam because we're three minutes over already. Next week, it's Bad Grandma's. Randall Battenkoff is back with us and Florence Henderson's last film. So Randall's got a lot to say about that. So until next week, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens. (laughs) 